pop in. Um, Terry Paulson, our tournament director, is over here. And so that's our staff. Um, anything you guys need, please don't hesitate to ask. I know a lot of people say, oh, I, you know, I'm, I'm sorry for asking. That's what we're there for. That's what we get paid the big bucks for. Um, and so don't hesitate to ask, even if it's the same, a variation of the same question, because we want to make sure that you guys know um, what's going on. I do also want to recognize our board members who are in attendance. Um, BJ Bryant is over here. He is secretary. Yes, on the board. <laughs> I, always, I always get these mixed up. Um, Ted Schulte is over here. He is a junior rep, um, which will be voted on again later today. Enjoy all you can, <laughs> Sorry, Ted. Ted. <laughs> uh, Ann Slattery is in the back. She is treasurer. Okay. Jim Momsen, um, Vice President, BJ Leroy, Northeast, Nancy Paulson, Southwest, Southeast, Tim Woody, she is Northwest. I have to go like geographically to make sure I have the quadrants right. Um, and then um, also here is uh, Larry Shanick, he's our officials coordinator, or I'm sorry, officials assigner. So those are kind of the, the people that we rely on a lot. So I am going to introduce um, BJ Leroy, who is going to introduce our speaker for this morning. So um, that's what we do. I hope you're clapping for her and not for me. <laughs> we um, were. <laughs> okay, good. good. Um, my job this morning is uh, to introduce Emily Swanson. Emily is a uh, at first glance, her resume looks like a former player, a high-level player turned coach, and that's what she is. Um, she was a top 100 recruit coming out of high school, was a Big 12 uh, multiple uh, player of the week, and uh, she rolled that all into a graduate assistant job and got her coaching career kicked off. <clears throat> Stepping forward a couple of years, she has qualified teams for nationals, she resurrected a team back to the state level uh, at, uh, in high school, and she is now with our high performance program coaching the A1 players, which are, in theory, the top uh, players at their age in, uh, in the country. So we put a lot of trust in her um, as far as USA Volleyball is concerned. If you dig just a little deeper on uh, Emily's background, you'll see that she graduated uh, magna cum laude. She went to law school, and she's a practic <clears throat> practicing attorney in Denver with uh, specialties in liabilities and employment law. And she's about to get into that in just a little bit. She is also a board member with Rocky Mountain Region and is their legal counsel, obviously. And uh, all of that is impressive if you're, uh, if you're an old seasoned coach. She's done all this by the ripe old age of 28. <laughs> oh, pretty impressive resume for that, uh, for the short amount of time that she's been doing this. Most interesting to me is that Emily is a clearly self-made person from the toughest of backgrounds. And, uh, well, I'm not going to get into that, or we're not going to talk about that today. Trust me in that if there's a fight of some kind, whether it be legal or verbal or maybe even physical, Emily is the side that you want to be on. So luckily for us, she is uh, as generous as she is tough and sharp, and she is going to help us with a couple of blind spots that we may have as, as club directors. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce Emily Swanson. niche is youth sports organizations and representing them. So I have clients 
all across the country, be it uh, soccer clubs, basketball clubs, uh, obviously volleyball clubs, um, and, and kind of taking a proactive approach. Because what I find a lot of times is that um, you guys invest tens and sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars into your clubs, your facilities, um, you know, your education, all of that kind of stuff, and you don't spend the money to talk to a lawyer before you go and do that kind of stuff. So what I get a lot of times are clubs coming to me and saying, I have this problem now, how do I fix it instead of, you know, setting it up from the beginning to not have that problem. Um, BJ is a, a pretty close friend of mine, and we talk a lot about what goes on across the country volleyball-wise in a legal aspect. And when I thought about what I could present to all of you guys, um, it sometimes is very difficult to find a couple of issues that are going to be applicable to every single one of you. Um, like in a contract sense, because you have a different contract than this person, and, and their contract says something different than yours. So I kind of found two issues here, specifically across the country and to Wisconsin, that I think um, in talking to directors and talking to some of you know, directors here and, and board members that maybe you guys aren't aware of. When I give this presentation, I've done it a lot across the nation um, about this one specific issue, employee misclassification. What I find a lot of times is that you guys don't like what I have to say. Um, and so what I've done in that cute little folder that you guys have is uh, provide you some materials that you can look at later that back up what I have to say so that you know that I'm not crazy and I don't just make this stuff up and um, that I'm you know, not paid to say a specific thing. The law is what it is. So the one issue that I think is the most prevalent across the country um, affecting youth sports organizations at the moment is employee misclassification. And every time I talk to a club director, somebody says, well, why should I, why should I care about that? Um, so I'm going to tell you. I do have to uh, throw a disclaimer in there that I am not actively licensed to practice law in the state of Wisconsin, um, which means that if you get sued, I can't represent you, but I can give you consulting advice. Okay, so there's a distinction. Just know that whatever I have to say here, if you plan on implementing it, I recommend that you go maybe talk to a attorney licensed in Wisconsin just to cover my own butt. Okay. Employee misclassification. Who knows what employee misclassification, misclassification even is? No? Nobody? Nobody's raising a hand? Right. That's why it's a problem. Okay? So, this employee misclassification is basically you're either, as an employer, classifying your coaches. This is where it really applies to your coaches as employees or independent contractors. Who classifies their coaches as employees? Raise your hand. All right, not very many of you. Independent contractors? Everyone's 1099? Yeah, lots of you. This is where it becomes a problem, okay? Um, there are different tests and it does have different implications. What I'm really gonna focus on in this is the federal implication because that's where you're gonna get into the most trouble. Um, you're obviously the employer. The coaches are workers for context of reading this. This is going to be available um, for you, either myself or the region, however we want to work it. Can email it to you so you don't have to take crazy detailed notes now. And I know the font's a little small. Um, so if you want it at a later point, I can get that to you. My opinion and the opinion of the IRS, typically every time this has become an issue, is that you guys are oftentimes misclassifying your coaches. Probably eight times out of ten that I've looked at this issue, coaches are misclassified. They're not independent contractors the majority of the time. Why? Okay. Why is this even an issue? So, employees have certain rights <coughs> that independent contractors do not. Okay. Part of that is civil protections, discrimination, um, you know, FLSA protections, all that kind of stuff that really you guys aren't, I'm not worried about you guys discriminating, right? But what I am often concerned about is the, and, and really presents the biggest issue, is the increased tax burden that we place on independent contractors when they're typically employees. And that's where people get into the most trouble. 
Um, why do people misclassify? Sometimes, ah, oh, my heel is stuck in this thing. <laughs> Sometimes um, people do it intentionally because it's cheaper, right, for a club. Um, sometimes people just say, well, that's what everybody else does. It must be right. I have no idea, right? Um, why, why does the country care? So the IRS has now basically implemented task forces in most states, including Wisconsin. Okay, they've given Wisconsin, I think, $500,000 last time I looked to basically create a task force to look into this issue specifically because at one point the Department of Labor lost nearly $200 million in tax revenues based on this classification issues. Um, and, and really, it creates some kind of unfair advantage because people that are properly classifying their coaches are uh, have increased costs. I mean, that's just the reality of the situation. And so um, there is some sort of unfair competition that goes on. And so the IRS is kind of stepping in and, and trying to put a stop to that. Okay, cost of classification. When you classify somebody as an employee, which a few of you raised your hands and said that you did, right? You split the tax burden. When you're an independent contractor, as a coach, if I'm an independent contractor, I pay the whole darn thing myself, right? So you guys are typically sending out their checks and you're not withholding taxes, and then at the end of the year, I've got to go in and I've got to, when I'm doing my taxes, I've got to go back and pay that full amount that maybe we should have been splitting, I don't know. The other thing that really hits somebody when they're an independent contractor is that self-employment tax, right, at the end of the year. Um, that's a pretty big burden depending on what you guys pay your coaches. Um, workers' compensation taxes, that's... Workers' compensation we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, whereas an independent contractor, I'm responsible for myself and my own injuries. Um, employee is covered under employer's liability insurance as an agent. What that means is if I'm driving to a tournament, and I'm an employee, classified as an employee, and I hit somebody, I'm covered under your liability insurance. Now, if I'm an independent contractor, and I'm driving along and I hit somebody, my own insurance um, takes effect at that point. Uh, at one point, an expert calculated that if somebody earned $31,200 a year before taxes, they would be left with $10,660.80 if they were paid as an independent contractor compared to $21,885.20 if they were paid as an employee. This is where it becomes an issue. When people start to know, when co disgruntled coaches figure out that maybe you've been misclassifying them, they, they may complain, right? And that's typically when I talk to clubs, how it comes about. It's either a former coach that is now pissed off at the club for whatever reason that goes and complains to the IRS, the Department of Labor, the State Board, Wisconsin Board of Labor, whatever it is, or another club that maybe is, is angry because they think that you know you recruited some of their players, stole some of their best players, they'll go and complain. Doesn't matter where the complaint comes from. Once the IRS starts looking into it, you may or may not be screwed. So again, um, Wisconsin has been given a huge grant to kind of look into this issue. This is why I think that you should care at this point because clubs across the nation have been hit with this. And there's a specific article in your folder that I gave you um, that talks about a soccer club that was hit with almost $400,000 in back tax fees for misclassification of their coaches. Really important here. In Wisconsin, there is a presumption in the 